I'm gonna leave all the other stuff open so hopefully you can keep seeing this. Oh, that's tiny though. So on your own screen, you can down here in the um, <laughs> files area, what I have open is the RMD, so presentation slides RMD. Um, if you would prefer the HTML fancy version, that's the knitted version. But if you're wanting to take notes, I would tell you to leave open the uh, RMD. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, I didn't want to do that. I can show his whisper to get quiet and pinch this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to do this in presentation mode, though, so I'm letting it load. Uh, but thank you. First, thank you all for inviting me. Um, I'm Aaron, obviously. I, I wore my mask cat shirt, so the math is on the shirt and not in the presentation, since it's uh, heard a mixed audience. Also, I'm moving. I don't know where anything is in my house. So, um, <clears throat> so a little bit about me. My background is actually in computational linguistics. So that's why I was asking earlier, is this like the classics language department, the linguistics department? It's kind of like a mix of both, it sounds like. Um, but I'm actually a psychologist. Uh, my degree is in cognitive psych, and I have a special focus on statistics. So, <laughs> uh, but I'm currently working at Harrisburg University, we're STEM school, so teaching in the data science department and analytics, and I teach computational yeah. linguistics, so natural language processing and human language analyses. Uh, but today I'm going to talk about multi-level models. Hi. Couple of assumptions that you understand regression, but please interrupt me if you don't understand anything I'm saying. So I could like power through all these slides and you guys could just sit there with that glazed face if that happens in stats classes. Don't do that. Feel free to ask me questions. Um, tell me when you don't understand something. <laughs> and we have, yeah, great. That would be good. Because I'll get really animated and excited otherwise and we'll go on for too long. I am recording um, so that I can put it on YouTube so you can watch it later if you need to. So kind of a, a start on what are multi-level models. Um, I think I can make the font a little larger here. Yeah. So increasingly popular approach to modeling hierarchically structured data. So sometimes people call these uh, hierarchical linear models. I've heard them called mixed models. Uh, multi-level models kind of the ubiquitous name for all of them. Uh, it kind of sounds like multi-level marketing though. So this is better <laughs> than those. Um, so it outperforms classical regression. I don't know why it wrote classical there. Um, so this is Andrew Gelman. Um, he writes for uh, a bunch of stats blogs. And so mostly, if you've seen people argue about numbers on the internet, he's probably one of them. Okay. Um, but I really love the Andy Field book as well. So this is Discovering Statistics Using R. Um, and he makes lots of cheese jokes, which makes me happy because I make lots of cheese jokes as well. Um, but multimodal models eat data for breakfast. Okay. Uh, if you're looking at spending some of your hard-earned dollars on a stats book, his is one of the best. And it's cheaper and a great doorstop because it's like this big. Right, it's like 80 bucks or so. Um, so today I want to talk about what are MLMs and then how do you analyze MLMs. So I've got three examples. Uh, so a linear model with NLME package. A kind of gross example uh, with the linear model, and then a nonlinear model with the Glimmer package. Well, it's Glimmer function in LME package. So why would we use these? Why not regular regression? So in regular regression, we're saying, hey, these x variables predict this y, um, or why not repeated measures, ANOVA, right? So data structures are often hierarchical. Um, I got from some of the examples of the research that you guys are doing, uh, most of your data is actually hierarchical. Okay. So from my own work in items, we um, deal with people looking at word pairs and trying to judge the relationships of those word pairs. So we kind of make participants play family feud and uh, look at their understanding of their own linguistic knowledge. So we have tons of items. Each participant sees 120 items or more. Or I could be t testing people repeatedly. Right? So um, I know you sent me some eye tracking data. That's the definition of repeated data. Right? 
So anytime you have repeated data that you want to use, where you don't want to create averages for each participant, you want to use all of the data points. So that's the best part about these is that you can use every data point, not reduce each person into one average score, okay. which is good for lots of reasons. So some examples from my own work, each person will judge 120 items. We have them uh, judge things like cheddar and cheese, how related are these? Uh, so it's family feud, but you're guessing the numbers. Um, rather than averaging for each person an average judgment or creating a, a slope for each person, um, instead I use all those data points. Okay. Uh, some research that I'm going to show you from a friend of mine is um, they're doing daily diary studies where they're testing people across days to see if people's behavior grows over time. And so um, that's kind of an example of a growth model where I could model time as my variable rather than just the averages. Okay. So you can use it as a variable or you can just simply control for it. So you want to test people over 10 days and you don't care if they're changing over time, you could still use all 10 days. <laughs> so some benefits. So homoscedasticity, yes, maybe some, some of these faces. So homoscedasticity is the uh, assumption of equal error variances where we want the residuals or the, the mistakes that we make in a regression to be fairly even. Okay. This is easy to break um, or be broken because uh, if you are not very good at predicting, like say the low end of the data, you'll get a wide spread, but you're good at the high end, you get a kind of megaphone shape. I always tell my students, no cheerleaders, because right, we don't want these megaphone shapes. If we're bad at predicting at one end and good at the other end. With this type of model, doesn't matter. So we can model the variability in the slopes. So uh, we can understand why we're bad at predicting one end versus the other. Uh, the assumption of independence. Independence is that each person's data point is separate from every other data point. Obviously, that's not true in repeated measures data. Right? I am me through the entire study. Um, so now I can control for me being me. Right? Uh, so it's basically regression for repeated observations. Okay. Now let me know if I'm going too fast. Uh, and the missing data. And you still have to exclude missing data. But if you're measuring people time one, time two, time three, so my friend was measuring them up to 14 days in a row, sometimes they didn't do a day. Okay. In a regular analysis, you just have to drop the whole person okay. or estimate their score. In this type of analysis, you just don't have that day. So it, it interpolates between you know day two, they missed day three, to day four. Okay. Yeah. Oh, the assumption of independence mm -hmm. can also be broken? Mm -hmm. oh. Well, it's not broken, you're accounting I mean, for it. Yeah. Just as far as you know, you need to be there, not don't right. need to be there. Right. But you those are, are all three things that yeah, where we needed another model, you know. Perfect. Yep. Will so, you go into the math of the independence or or in general? Uh, I can. So uh, when we get to talking about random intercepts, mm -hmm. what you do is you usually add the participant as their own random intercept, so it controls for the correlated error of me, me, me through the entire study. Mm -hmm. So it's another parameter that you're adding. It kind of depends on what type of model, but it's mm -hmm. estimated like in a linear model with a normal distribution. Mm -hmm. And for this workshop, are you planning to do uh, a more practical thing on how to do some R, or are you going to go oh, into yeah. this? Oh, okay. yeah. We got examples. Examples on examples. Right now, I'm just trying to, I was trying to hopefully gauge to where, what level to talk at, because I know there are some people that have had several classes and some people who haven't, so. It's the worst crowd. Because <laughs> you're like, okay, do I talk up here, down here? That's why I left the math on the shirt, right? But, um, so really great art article by Mike Bryce, uh, Mark Brisbert, Brisbert, I can't ever say his name right, um, on power. So I didn't want to go through a whole bunch of power examples because they tend to get um, into the weeds on simulating data, but he has a really readable paper that will show you how they're so much more powerful than um, repeated measures ANOVA. So he takes several examples from the literature and then repeats them. It's also open access, so another win there. Um, but the benefit of MLM really is power. So I can analyze every item. So instead of having 50 participants and 120 items that I've crushed into one, I now have 6,000 data points. 
and that clearly is much better. Um, it doesn't really solve a, like a sampling bias problem, so you can't get away with, oh, well, now I only need 20 people because you still right, have the, the inherent issues of samples needing to match their, their population, but maybe I don't need quite 2,000 people. Instead, I can get away with 100. Um, so this really, to me, is the, the most benefit. That's why I had the title that I did for the workshop of powering you through it because these are more powerful. Um, they also allow you to not assume that every item is the same. Yeah. So will Lesberg have, um, so my training has been in ANOVA. Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. And there, I would know how to figure out power. Mm -hmm. So would there be guidance in that I article or, you I know? I think like, they have the R code for their power, their power simulations. They actually like will have a have it where they work. Like here's how they ran the ANOVA, and here's how we do it in a multi-level model, and here's how many participants we think you need versus the other. Yeah, um, and they make recommendations for linguistic studies. Um, how many participants and how many items are appropriate for 80% power? Yeah, it's really great. It's one of my favorites. Um, now I lost where I was going though. No, you're fine. Power is great. That's all. <laughs> okay. um, so getting into like what the how these are different. Right? So in regular regression, it's a um, what's called a closed form solution, right? meaning that mathematically, if you input the x, you will get some sort of b value, a regression slope that predicts y. Okay. It may not be good, but um, the the math is fixed. Okay. These are not closed form solutions. Uh, there are estimated. We're going to use maximum likelihood estimation because it tends to work the best, but there are other options. Um, and so we will input fixed coefficients. This is your normal regression stuff. Okay. So this is where the intercepts and the slopes are um, the same across different conditions. Um, so if you have each participant, the, the intercept is one number and the slope is one number. Hey, for everyone. And this is the style of ANOVA. Because ANOVA is just a fancy form of regression, okay. mathematically. The new part is the random coefficients. Okay. And these are the, I, it, like, if, to me, if you're going to struggle to get one of these things, this is going to be the spot. Okay. Um, now we're allowing participant intercepts or slopes or both to vary. I have to cross different contexts because it could be by participant, it could be by item, it could be by day. So it kind of depends on the variable you pick. What that means is that for, we estimate for each participant the, the intercept. Um, that means that they all can start at different points. So this is really great for studies where you expect differences in um, the average Y score. So I always use um, school examples. So when you're teaching a classroom full of students, do you guys get to do that sometimes? Yay, mm -hmm. isn't it so much fun? <laughs> it's gotta be close to finals too right now, right? Yeah. yeah. We're um, some of them are C students, some of them are A students. So they're starting in different places. So a random intercept would allow the C student to start at C and see if they're growing, and the A student to start at A and they don't really have anywhere to go, right? Um, <clears throat> maybe down, who knows? Uh, so that's where the random part is. It lets them start in different places. And a random slope means that they can grow at different rates or decrease at different and to me, that really allows us to understand the variability in our data, whereas before we present these regression models, we're just kind of like, the slope increased by two points. Um, now I can say, well, for some people, it's two points, but for other people, it's up to four points. Okay. All right. uh, oh, well, this picture is huge, unfortunately. Let's see if we can make it smaller. There we go. So this is from the Andy Field. Okay. So it's a goofy example, because Field's examples are always either sex, drugs, or rock and roll. That's your style. So this is about libido. <laughs> um, but the main thing to get here is that the slope is fixed. Okay. So every slope has the same um, shallowness. I don't know. What's this hand motion. Don't you wipers? Um, but the intercepts are different. So at zero, which is here, uh, each line crosses in a different spot. Okay. The dotted line is the average. 
So this is a much better representation of the data because now I have a slope that's different for each group. Okay. So it fits the, the points better than the average line. Okay. So that would be a, a random intercept model. Okay. We could instead reverse that and do a random slope and a fixed intercept. So they all cross zero at the same point, but now have different slopes. This would be a little unusual. Generally, you start with fixed intercepts. But they could come out to be not different. And then a um, final model, when we talk about the steps that you normally take for these, uh, would be random slope and a random intercept. Okay. So participants start and vary differently. So these help me because it's much more visual of what I'm doing. Um, generally, most of the time, the models are at this point. Okay. So if, I, if I had to tell you what kind of model I end up doing, it's usually this one. Okay. Why do you not use the random slope? Because it doesn't always make sense theoretically. Oh, because one of your functions is controlled or something? Because mo a lot of my work, they don't actually vary by slope. So if we test that model, it's just not any different. Okay. Um, or it just doesn't theoretically make sense to assume that there are differences. All right. So sometimes it's a reviewer thing, <laughs> practically. <yeah. laughs> You find that the reviewers often tell you to fit the maximal model in? No, I actually generally find the reverse that they don't know what it is. <laughs> so we, in, we get like, why don't you just use regression? Like, yeah, that's yeah. inappropriate mathematically. And, um, so for, for when, in that scenario, when they tell me don't do this analysis, we usually come back with a paragraph about correlated error. Right, we should control for participant correlated error, and here's why these are good. So I have like a blurb that I have used. I've <laughs> plagiarized myself over and over again. Um, and then they usually go away, because then they just give up on fighting you. I'm scared. Yeah. The worst is when you get someone who actually knows what's going on, because then they're really picky. <laughs> right. Why didn't you use BRMS? I'm like, because I don't like it. It scares me. <laughs> Kind of to your question, where we're going. So bo uh, models are built up sequentially from nothing, essentially, to everything. I have a little star here because um, I have several friends that would disagree that say start with everything and work your way down. Uh, you're nodding <laughs> your head over here. You could go either way. I'm going to start from nothing and work my way up. Um, you could start from everything, work your way down. So the steps would just be in reverse order. Right? Uh, but definitely, like re research and theory guide you on what you're doing, do random slopes make sense to your question? Um, so generally, we just kind of argue that they don't make a lot of sense for what we're doing um, and move on. Uh, and then we'll test them against each other to determine which one's best. Okay. So it, by changing one thing at a time, we can tell if the addition of random slopes was important. So to assess that fit, so you can use p-values, um, hopefully in the kind of revolution. Somebody mentioned you were talking about the replication crisis. Um, hopefully we're moving away from p-values. Yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's nice to be in a good audience for that because I talk to my data science friends and they're like, what? And I'm like, <sighs> so let me tell you about p. I listened to a talk the other day for somebody from NIH who was talking about how they were good p-values, and I was like, oh, cringe. <laughs> yeah, these are better than the other ones. I'm like, oh, don't do that. Anyways, so we could use AIC, which is the Akaki Information Criterion, um, or Schwartz-Bayesian Criterion, but for all of these, lower is better. Um, they don't have a bounds, though. So they can be negative, they can be positive. They can be thousands, they can be four. So sometimes people are uncomfortable with these because they're not, they don't have their infinity, right? Um, so lower numbers mean less error, even if they're negative. So things that are more, that are closer to zero are better. <laughs> but we can also do log likelihood. So log likelihood is chi-square. It's based on the residual error in the model. Uh, and we can use a chi-square difference test so the ANOVA function actually doesn't do an ANOVA. This makes my students crazy. <laughs> it actually tests if two models are different from each other, so it kind of ANOVAs on a model. Okay. 
so what would happen when you run this function, because we'll look at it, it takes the log likelihood of model one minus the log likelihood of model two, so this is a subtraction of chi-square values, and it will calculate the p-value for you, but the way it does that is it takes the difference in degrees of freedom. Right? So if you add one piece to the model, the difference in degree of freedom is one, right? and just compares that to a critical chi-square. Right? So for example, at p less than 0.05, everybody's favorite magic number, uh, chi-square is 3.84. So these are sensitive to sample size, which now is much larger. Uh, so often models are pretty much always different. Because okay. with one degree of freedom, you only gotta get four points better. Okay. So some careful uh, interpretations of that. Hi, get one of them to show you how to get into this. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> All right, so some steps. Um, we'll start with our baseline intercept only model, and it's really only for, I don't ever interpret this, it's really only to look at model two. Um, you could interpret it though. Some people use it for uh, ICC values, if you're familiar with those interclass correlation coefficients. Then we'll add a random intercept to the model based on whatever um, level you kind of want to work at. So it could be, like I said, participants, items, days, just kind of depends. Um, if model one is better than model two, in theory, it says that you should be doing MLM. Uh, if not, you could go back to regression uh, or ANOVA, but I would argue that you should control for correlated error because you should anyway, um, and or power. Because okay. the power is not changing even if the, mod the correlated error isn't significant. So in some papers, what we've done is just actually totally skip step one. We're like, we are doing, we are controlling for participants in this random intercept, end of story. Okay. Um, but I didn't want you guys to not know how to do step one, just in case. Uh, model three is our fixed effects, the stuff you care about usually, and model four would be a random slopes model. Okay. Depending on what you're doing, you may not want model four to be good because that would imply that you have lots of different variability in your slope and maybe we want to present a unified model. So this is the slope. Uh, it doesn't vary by participant. Okay. Like I said, a lot of these depend on the research question that you're asking. Uh, so I'm gonna use your eye tracking project. Um, all of this data is in the folder. I did have to reduce it though so it would run in a reasonable amount of time because I think you had almost like 500,000 lines, which is awesome. But this is cloud services, so it was like running really slow. Um, so you can interrupt me at any time, tell me if I'm misinterpreting what you sent me. But there are a couple of groups. So our IV, we've got an interpreter, a monolingual Spanish speaker, right? And then an uh, advanced L2 speaker. Um, condition that they were viewing on the screen was either figurative or not language and then if there was an equivalent expression in English or not. Um, and the dependent variable I picked from your set was the proportion uh, and I think this is a good example because it'll show us some, some problems that you'll see with assumptions checks. Okay. And we could randomize by participant. That's the normal place that I start is controlling for correlated error of me being me but also trials. And so to your question, let's look at some code. Okay. Let me have some coffee first. So I've re read in the data set, and thank you for giving me an example you to work with. Suggest, yeah. Sorry, and this is maybe to the group, and it's a fair amount and it's a no, but could you tell us a little bit what you were looking for theoretically sure. so that we can like get the story of what it is yeah. But we can take a vote and we can oh, no, no. Or stay if you are willing. For a so um, in the study I was um, testing where uh, in the speakers when we were speakers in advance and the people who study can anticipate the idea of expression. Uh, so the idea is that uh, you can get the expression once you possess a specific element, even if you haven't said the end of the expression, you can already anticipate you're going to hear that. And then um, the proportional distribution for target means that participants, they were seen to work
short testing experience in square three. And then uh, depending on what they were doing, we just did like to which more they were looking. And if uh, it was the correct word to fix the expression, then that was the target. Okay, what is the correct word to fix it now? Like for example, in an expression, um, like um, for anything in the word, like word would be the target. Because it's the end of the expression. Mm -hmm. okay. So we check whether they're looking at the word before they actually hear it. I so it's about prediction. Yeah. Oh, I, didn't, I didn't catch that part. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, expectancy generation effects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's neat. Does that help contextualize? Yes. Yeah, I was like, oh, not mine. <laughs> I can tell you way more about the ones that are mine in here. Um, <laughs> but I wanted to do something that you guys kind of had been working on. <laughs> so, anyway. All right, so just pulling in the data. Um, you already actually have the data in um, what I would call long format. So one issue with these models is that you have to have the data in, if you've done ggplot, it functions the same way, where each trial is its own line. So if you have the data in like Y, what I would call Y format, um, where each trial is its own column, you do have to either melt or spread, I don't know, it's not spread, it's gather in tidyverse. Um, I like reshape. But either way, each line needs to be its own trial or like measurement point, which means you have to have a column for the trial index and some sort of column usually for the participant index. Uh, and that's the biggest thing on data setup for these. Um, and so that's what I just had here. So in wide format, each row is its own participant. Every, it's like the, I used to use the phrase unique snowflake until that became this weird political thing, but each person is their own individual person and they get their own row, that's wide format. Long format is where each measurement gets its own row. Okay. So be sure it's in long format first. <coughs> so we're gonna use NLME and the nice thing about the workspace is it already has it installed. Um, so when you do this on your own, you will have, if you don't have that already, you'll have to install it. Um, others like the LME4 package. Uh, I like NLME because it has less, it gives me less errors. They, they both do the same thing. They use slightly different algorithms. So you tend to get the same answers with just like decimal places difference if you run the comparable analysis. Um, I feel like it's like half and half of people when I ask them which one they use. But NLME just stands for nonlinear mixed effects, which we're actually not gonna use for the nonlinear example. And the irony is not lost on me. Um, but Either way, so I'm gonna teach you in LME. It's very similar to LME4, just slight differences in the way you write it. Um, the GLS function is the first step, and that's actually in base R, so it's in the stats package. Okay. Um, and it allows us to test an intercept only model, assuming there will be some correlated error. So we don't wanna use just LM for, for normal linear modeling, because it assumes there is no correlated error. A generalized least squares model the LS stands for does assume like, oh, there's gonna be some error due to participants. And the general format in R for regression functions is Y, your dependent variable, the tilde for is estimated by, and all of your X variables. Data set is equal to your data set name, and then the other important stuff depends on what we're doing. So I'm gonna show you what all those options are. So kind of jumping right in. Loaded NLME, I can make this maybe a little, ooh, that's a little too big, okay. okay. Uh, I'm just gonna call these models one, model two, model three, because that helps me remember what step it is. So we've got GLS here, so our target proportion is the dependent variable, okay. predicted by one. Okay. So that indicates that you just want the intercept. Um, that's really handy if you're maybe trying to estimate an average score for participants, but you want to control for the error. So this is the way you can actually get the mean score, controlling for like co the fact that participants are who they are, rather than just running averages. Um, so, or you could estimate by group this sort of way. So with no x variable, you use one to indicate that it's the intercept. The data set I just called master data set. Method here is maximum likelihood. There are other options. Uh, maximum likelihood, if you haven't had a class that uses iterative procedures, 
um, estimates a distribution on each parameter. Right? So at the moment, that's just the intercept and picks the most likely one. Right? So instead of just estimating, or instead of churning through a closed form solution of regression, it actually says, well, the like, here's a set of possible parameters, here's the most likely one. Um, and then NA action, NA omit, is just to get rid of any NA values in there. Um, one warning though, because we're gonna compare model one to model two, you probably have to deal with any NAs before because it will throw an error if you run um, model one and model two and they have different numbers of participants in them because it doesn't like that. It needs to be the same number of data points, which I, have to, I had to do in one of my examples. Okay. All right, let me scroll down here. So looking at the output, this is not super interesting, but you can see the AIC, BIC, and the log, and this is chi-square over here. Um, it's not actually chi-square because it's negative, uh, but it's, you can think about it kind of as um, a similar value to chi-square. We've got our intercepts, so hangouts number 0.46, so that tells me that on average, people are getting to the target a little less than chance. It does tell you if that's different from zero, that may or may not be an interesting question. Uh, and then our residuals. So this model is not interesting until you build it onto a r random slopes model. I'm oh, sorry, random intercepts model. Okay. But just kind of a, to tell you what it, what it does, it tells me that our average score for our DB test if that's different from zero and really provides me a comparison point. So let's see, if 46 is better or worse than, um, like if 46 varies, basically is the next question. So you can see this, people call this nesting, and this is how I talk about it too, when I nest the data. Uh, sometimes, I don't wanna use the word cluster, because cluster is an entire set of other analyses that people can do, um, but nesting just makes it sound like you're like a bird, I don't, it's a weird word, but um, when somebody says they nested on, what they're telling you is what they controlled for in their random variable. Uh, personal experience, I start with participants um, because they're gonna be the most internally consistent, you know, depending on factors, and the most externally different. So each person is different from every other person, but you know, generally their scores are somewhat consistent. This is how they catch cheaters, actually is that they, they show that the data points are not internally consistent by participants. Okay. Um, so that's generally where I start. Okay. There are lots of ideas on how to build the levels, is what they're called, uh, but participants the easiest one to start with. So wait, does the ordering of the random intercepts matter in your model? Uh, depends, yes, I have an example. So. Uh, sometimes it will crash which we can make happen actually, if, we, if you guys want to. So we'll start with one, I'll add another one, and if, if, uh, if you want, I can show you what it looks like when it doesn't run. So uh, we can add other important considerations and the order and depth of how many levels you have is research focused. So we've done ones where we control by participant and then by time point in the day, and then by day, so we actually have three levels. Generally, I find one to be su sufficient, but you can test them. So you could test a random intercept model with just one of them, just the other one, or both. See which one works best. Okay. Uh, and most people don't consider that fishing, okay. where you're, you're trying to find the best control for correlating error. Most people don't consider that like p-hacking. Um, I've seen some people be like, well, it should have been theory. It's like, well, the theory was it could be one or both. Mm -hmm. So. <clears throat> You just have to explain it well. So how to add that? First three lines are the same, four lines are the same, this is the piece here. So this is why I like NLME better than LME4. It's because it's really obvious, hopefully, what you're doing. Here's the random component. Um, so tilde one is for our intercept, the pipe icon, and then what you want your random intercept to be. So it's weird because the, the piece after the intercept, this is the intercept back here. Okay. So that basically says nest by participant. So now I've got, you see that's changed, linear mixed effects model, with maximum likelihood. We'll see these AICs and BICs again. Put 
this is the part I want to talk about. Here. <laughs> they always have energy when you don't want them to. <laughs> That's how my uh, animals are. And some of my videos on my website, you can like hear the animals walking around in the background. My students, I teach online a lot. My students are amused when the cat like comes into the video. So. Okay, so the random effects component here. Um, what that does is I still have the estimates. So you notice it went, it's like a basically the same, but the standard deviation tells me how much people are varying. So you interpret that just like a standard deviation on the mean. So in general, when you're studying here for half of the data, uh, participants are scoring math 39 to 46 plus 7, 53. So it gives you an idea of like where their scores are. So that 64% of the data for standard deviations okay, is between 39 and 53. So the larger that this number is, the more variability you have. Okay, if that number is close to zero, then they're all pretty much the same. Okay. Um, so what this model provides me is the random intercept as a number uh, and just how much variance there is for uh, your target proportion. Uh, so yeah. this, so this, yeah. Does this mean that we have 39 participants in this experiment? Does that mean mm -hmm. that? Okay. Mm -hmm. I uh, pulled 13 from each of the groups. Say that again, please. Uh, so there were those three, interpreter, monolingual, and um, mm -hmm. advanced L2. I pulled 13 of them from each one. Okay. So that's where the 39 comes from. Okay. Is there a way to see their means from this model? So or nested it by participant, yes. So you can see the estimates. For that, I'll have to go over here. For that, I will wait. Yes. Can you just state the question to us and what is it you were looking for? Uh, okay, not that window. Oh, I closed my slides. Uh, yes. Let me answer this one first. That's what I'm saying. Like, can we establish once more, even though you just asked the question? Oh, yeah. So we, we were looking at uh, here, right? Random effects. Uh -huh. um, and so your question was, can I see, uh, this is based on the larger data set for that uh -huh. I was trying before, but can I see the uh, average score for each person? Each person, not each person. This point it's each person because okay. I did a model with participant. Yes. Yes. Okay. So to do that, I will need to rerun this. But you were also saying, so you said something about the score ranging from 39 to 57, mm -hmm. if I understand that. Mm -hmm. And then we said we have 39 participants, which represent 13 from each group. Yes. So mm -hmm. that range of score is? By participant. By participant. Yes. So, so. so at this point, we don't really, we can't really understand much about how each group, group did. No, I haven't yet. done group yet. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So if you want to see this coefficient, you can run oh, okay. um, yeah. model two dollar sign coefficients. And then it will show you the random one by participant. And when we add the next level, it'll show me both. So for each person, I can now see their Estimated. intercept. Okay. Yeah. Um. And the reason we're proceeding the way we are because you started with like from nothing to building. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And you can work the other way. So by the time you see all of them, you would just. It's been a while I've done this kind of work, so I'm just kind of. No, you're fine. Um, all the questions. So here's the intercept. The, the tricky part here is the interpretation. So the intercept is the 0.459. This is actually this person's deviation from the intercept. Mm -hmm. So they're 0.003 above it. This took me a while to figure out myself. Okay. Um, this person's 0.08 below it. Mm -hmm. So that standard deviation is calculated on their difference from the fixed intercept. Mm -hmm. Is it a quick and easy sort of way to get the actual estimate? Like, 
giving the mental translation or subtracting from or, or did you take added politics and all that? I think since it's the way it's set up, I think I can do that. I don't like to code on the fly because I can't spell. I think oh, I didn't like that. So something to the effect of taking this uh -oh. and making it a number. I see. And yeah. then taking these as a, uh, at the moment it doesn't like it because they're named, I think. Oh, what did I do by participant? Oh, that worked. Okay. It looks crazy. Mm -hmm. So the fixed times, or not times plus. Try that again. There we go. Okay. So you just, yeah. yeah. And then once we're done, if you refresh the, like, uh, go back to the link, uh, then updated code will be there too. Yeah. No problem. It's a good question. Um, I think too, if you just use something like T apply, if you're familiar with that, or calculating averages by group, you would get pretty much the same answer, but this is built into the structure of the model at least. <clears throat> All right. So let me see if I can go back. I have another question. Is there a reason why you start by adding a random effect instead of the one of the fixed effects? Other than history? <laughs> uh, I think it's the idea it that really these started, when people started doing these models, it was to prove that you needed the random effect. Like, otherwise, oh, I'll just do repeated measures. Mm -hmm. um, so it was kind of like a, a proof of concept. I need this model because there are these differences inherent in the data. Um, I don't know that you, now I would just, I just say I need this model because the data is structured this way. Mm -hmm. um, so I generally start here and then add fixed effects. You could go in any order, I suppose. It would, it might be confusing because um, when you add fixed effects, you're using, maybe adding multiple predictors and then you add the random intercept on top and so watching them change. Mm -hmm. It might be weird to do fixed and then the both of the randoms. I don't know that there's a reason for the structure, except for the fact that people used to use it as a way to show I have to have this. Yeah. I'll pause the back up here. Right, great questions. So where we were here, okay, so we did this one. Uh, now I'm gonna add a second level. And to do that, this, did the, this gets back to your question of, does the order matter, so yes. So I put, Trial index first, then participant, because each participant has these trials. This is tricky to me because you could go either way. Right? I have each participant and they have the trials, right? or I have each trial and every participant. So if there's a more structured way, so the example in the Andy field about classrooms. Right? So there's a uh, classroom with a set of students that's nested in a school. So the structure is, so here's this school with this classroom and here are these students. Um, when we're talking about each person seeing every item, you could flip them. Um, and here I have a note on convergence. When I flipped them, it didn't work. It, it worked in the sense that our graphs or mathematically something failed? Didn't Both. Converge? Yeah, it didn't converge. Uh, so R didn't crash in the sense that I had to restart it. Um, it didn't converge, meaning uh, mathematically it couldn't find a solution. Okay. So that's the cool thing about these is we can flip them. So if you have no theoretical motivation to put um, one of the random, um, um, ran, uh, one of the um, variables is random, random, does it matter in which order you put them, do you think? Mm -mm. You get the same answer. As long as you work. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna laugh if this actually ran today. So it runs on your smaller data set, but not your larger data set. <laughs> so I can't show to you that it doesn't work, but I can show you the difference here. So um, in looking at the output, it says participant and the trials. So it tells me that there are 39 participants in this data set and 624 trials on the reduced data set. Um, so this says that the participants are nested in trials. I had it the other way. So FYI, it doesn't run on your larger data set. <laughs> uh, in this particular case, I don't see a reason to pick one order over the other, except when I was doing this last night, it didn't run. Okay. Um, 
So that could be a way of taking convergence to change the order? Yes. <laughs> I think um, Noel already did that. So. Yeah, I know it does feel like cheating. Um, <laughs> If there's, a, if there's a clear reason, like for the school one, it makes sense why it should be students are nested in classes and schools, right? that structure makes sense. But when you're using items, I've never found a good reason why it should be participants over items because they're, they're the same structure. There's no, if some participants saw different items from other participants, then I might do item, item first because the, they're nested by participant. Um, so we've done that in a model where we Ran, we had like 3,000 items and we randomly showed them 100 of them. So we did items and then participants. But it ran the same the other way. In, in the data set, there are two versions of the experiment. So actually half of them saw one version and half of them saw the other version. So you might add that in there as well. The version. Version. Um, and sometimes, one, one thing we've done is actually try all the combinations <laughs> and see which one um, gave us the best control for correlated error. Uh, because at the moment, you're not talking about any of your hypotheses. Right. Uh, okay, so this one, with both of them, now you'll see that there are two effects. Right? So an effect for the trials, and that's a really small standard deviation, so it's not varying a whole lot by trial, their, their correctness. And then we still have a pretty, uh, an actually a bigger effect for participants within trials. Okay, so that standard deviation is larger. So now that we've added in trial, which you might expect um, because you have different types of trials, right? You're figurative, you're not, fig uh, you're um, equivalent in English part. So you would almost expect there to be differences within participants within trials. So they're going to perform differently on these different conditions. That's kind of what that's suggesting. Okay. Uh, but I still don't have any, I still don't know if, how it varies by, by the group, <coughs> which is what you had asked earlier. Uh, so let's see, did these work? Okay. Oh, this is the old knit. Hold on, let me make sure. I don't know why it's not saving. because that said 76 participants at the bottom. But while that does that, let me 